Good morning. Good morning. Um, it's, I'm really looking forward to carrying on the discussion that was initiated last night. I see some of you were there. Uh, this is a real opportunity for you to ask questions, and um, then we can all benefit from the answers. Um, before I start, I want to thank Market Street, which provided us the food. They do that for these events, and we're very grateful for their support. Um, it's my great pleasure to reintroduce Professor Ruth Van Dyke, who is a professor at uh, Binghamton University in Binghamton, New York, my, my family, my old family home. I spent part of my childhood there. 
Um, she's a very well-published archaeologist. Um, one of her books, The Chaco Experience, was published by SAR in 08, is that correct? 07, thank you. And um, having just recently familiarized myself with her work, I've been struck by how much care, which was beautifully written, that uh, isn't always the case with archaeology. Um, <laughs> apologies to the, <laughs> with, with apologies to the distinguished archaeologists in the room, uh, the other distinguished archaeologists in the room. Um, but uh, it's very effective work, um, it's, and and she focuses um, movingly on the experience. I mean, obviously reconstructing it both from her own experience and from the data available to her. What it would what it would have been like to live there and see the sunrise and watch the rain come and orient yourself uh, to these impressive buildings in the classic uh, Benito phase and so on. So uh, I, I strongly recommend her work. Um, and I think the forthcoming book, which we have later this year, is also going to be quite remarkable. Um, let me just start by posing a question to Ruth. Um, uh, I, I was going to pose a question that she said she didn't want to answer. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to split the difference. No, I was going to ask you, well, it's still kind of a mystery to me. I'm not going to not ask it, but I'm just going to say what it is. Um, <laughs> um, what, you know, that's the thing about it. It's, and I know it's controversial among archaeologists, but what would, it, what would everyday life have been there? Um, I mean, these immense buildings, and yet there's some reason to think that the population wasn't as dense as one would imagine with that level of, of built uh, infrastructure. Um, and there's questions about the level that there's clearly power being used and manipulated, uh, and I'm sure Ruth will say something about that. But what form would that have taken? It's it's a, it's still mysterious in that sense, and I think the data are ambiguous. And there's strongly held opinions on many sides of this issue. I recall being backed into a corner by an archaeologist in one of my first years here, and when I mentioned, I said something nice about an archaeologist who, whose work he felt was not entirely convincing, and I was pushed back into the corner. And if I'm this, I don't have a dog in this fight. You know, I work in the Amazon, so. Um, but uh, so, but but so Ruth countered with uh, uh, expressing a willingness to talk about what the experience might have been like to walk from the outliers to the, the center place. Is that, is that something you'd like to talk about? So let me do the handoff to our expert. Okay, thank you. And this is on. I can't actually tell. Can you see it on me? One person shaking her head now. I can't hear. A little louder. A little louder? Yeah. Okay. I have to use my lecture voice. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's always been really important to me to think about experience from a human bodily perspective at Chaco, and that's a piece of Chaco and archaeology that's, of course, really hard for archaeologists to get at. We're really good at looking at pottery and lithics and, and architecture and, and soil productivity and measuring those things, but we're, you know, it, it feels kind of dangerous for us maybe to venture out into imagining a sense of place at Chaco a thousand years ago. And I mean, there's good reason for that too. Obviously, myself as a now 21st century, you know, middle-aged white woman, I can't know what it was like to be a Chaco in person a thousand years ago on that landscape. And yet, as I argued last night, I, I think that I've come to believe that the way the, the structures were erected and sited and oriented and the way the roads were constructed, et cetera, really were trying to, the builders really were trying to emphasize an experience of center, an experience of center place for people who came into Chaco. So uh, using, uh, reading a lot of ethnography and also using a kind of controversial approach, um, a phenomenological approach, which is where you actually do go out and walk across the landscape and think about what are you seeing, what are you feeling, what are you experiencing. Um, I, I, I tried to delve into this a little bit. And I have somewhere in something I've written, it's not in what I gave you, but if you're interested, email me after and I'll send you a link. I, I wrote a little thing about what it would be like to walk from an outlier to Chaco. So I imagined that, um, or I imagined, I imagined this experience from the perspective of uh, like a nine-year-old girl who perhaps was getting the opportunity to go to Chaco from her outlier home for the first time. And I imagined that this was a journey she would undertake with her relatives. And I imagine this as female relatives and women, partly just to shake things up, because so often in our thinking about Chaco, we kind of default to thinking, 
you know, men are doing everything, and that's almost certainly not the case for many reasons. We can talk about that more if you want later. But so I imagine, imagine this, this young girl with her maybe mother and some aunts, and they're setting out to walk towards Chaco Canyon, and of course the young girl's very excited at the beginning of the day, and they're, they see in the distance certain landmarks that they need to navigate towards, and they're walking through the sand, and it gets hotter and hotter, and after a little bit she realizes, okay, this isn't what I thought it was gonna be, I'm really tired and thirsty, and <laughs> when are we gonna stop? And anyway, so along the way they do, they stop at other outliers, and they visit with relatives, and she gets to meet up with other cousins, and they play, and then the group goes larger, gets larger and larger the closer they get to the canyon. And of course they're under this amazing sky, and the whole time they're being guided by landmarks, by high places. Maybe they're walking towards the west edge of West Mesa, or maybe they're pointing themselves towards um, uh, another piece of Chakra Mesa that they can see in the distance. But they keep going until they arrive, they're fairly close to Chaco, and I imagine that they camped out maybe just outside of Chaco Canyon the night before, and um, at, at night they're seeing the stars, and they're thinking about what they're gonna encounter when they get into the canyon. And then ultimately they walk up I think of this vignette that I wrote, I imagine them coming from the west, so they walk up to the, the um, western escarpment of West Mesa, and they see some of those cairns that I showed you last night when I was talking about line of sight visibility. From the ground, when you're walking up the Chaco Wash, those cairns look like people standing up on the edge of the mesa. So I imagine that the young girl thinks, oh, there are people up there welcoming us. And then they walk into the canyon and they start to hear drumming and they start to smell smoke from fires and they start to hear dogs barking and they hear people singing and uh, finally they're at, um, at, in, in the heart of Chaco Canyon and they've arrived in the great houses and then of course they're surrounded, they're just completely awed by the sense that yeah, we have a great house at home but these are so much bigger and so much more formal. There are more people here than she's ever seen before and the excitement is just, kind of overwhelming. And um, some of her relatives get to go into various kivas or do various things, but she as a young girl isn't allowed to do those sorts of things yet, so she gets to just play with her friends and make a lot of new friends and, and run around in the canyon. So it's a little kind of a story, I guess, that I, that I imagined. Wait, well, let's just open it up for questions. It's your turn. So we will have to pass a microphone because of the live stream, so please be patient. But we'll get the mic to you, and please return the microphone to uh, our staff member um, when you're done speaking. <laughs> She wants me to talk about Aztec. Okay, so Aztec is one of the outliers that I showed you on that big map. It's a pretty important one, clearly. It's, um, how many of you have been to Aztec? Probably a lot, okay. You all know, yeah. So, um, so it's it's actually managed now under the same Park Service um, domain as, as Chaco Canyon. They have a shared superintendent, um, and it obviously was a really important place um, related to Chaco. I think the best evidence we have now suggests that it was founded in the late ten hundreds, and then continued into the eleven hundreds, and then actually continued into the twelve hundreds after activity in central Chaco Canyon had essentially ceased. So I think, and I'm not alone in this, and people like Steve Lexon have also argued that it became a kind of secondary center that then took over from Chaco Canyon in the 1100s. And there could be a lot of reasons for that. Uh, it could have been that Aztec was founded as kind of a, a, a Chaco expansion venue or, 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 or quest. You know, it could be that folks in Chaco were like, all right, well, this is going to be a really well-watered place where we can get a lot of corn to be grown, so let's go ahead and found an outlier here. And, um, and, and they found it. We think that, I actually had a graduate student who did her dissertation on some excavations uh, in what we think is the earliest of the three great houses at Aztec. You guys may not know, because when you went there, you visited Aztec West, certainly. Aztec West is one of three. You're probably aware that there's an Aztec East, right, which is also masonry, standing masonry, but it's not open to the public. But up on the mesa above, those two is Aztec North. And that's where we, we did some test excavations. It's a mysterious place because it seems to have been built out of basically adobe and sandstone spalls. And that's pretty unusual. It's not unheard of, but it's kind of an unusual material for a chapel and great house. And the, the pottery 
and the dates that we managed to get, we didn't get any cheering dates because you know there weren't any beams that we found, but we did do some radiocarbon dating on some of the samples that we obtained, and it appears to have been built um, in the in the late 1000s. So one idea is that when the Chacoans show up in Aztec, they get some locals together and they throw up this great house that looks good, that's up high, that everybody can see, but it's not actually as much of a labor sink as building like a real full-on masonry great house would be. Um, so it's the oldest, and then they build Aztec West, and then they build Aztec East, and as time goes on, they maintain Aztec North, but then after Aztec is over, of course it collapses, and today you don't really see much up there at all. So, let's see, there's so many things I could tell you, but you, what you probably want to hear me talk about is, so Steve Lexon has argued pretty famously that elites kind of marched out of Chaco and planted a flag at the end of North Road and founded Aztec. And I mean, I agree with Steve about some things, but about other things I really don't. So was North an important direction at Chaco? Of course it was, that's pretty clear. Um, was Aztec a successor to Chaco? I think it, it definitely was. I think that's pretty clear as well. But um, did people process along the North Road until they came to Aztec? The pr couple problems with that, I mean, one big problem is that it's debatable as to whether the North Road actually goes to Aztec. It, it, the last really good trace of it is at the edge of Coos Canyon, like I showed you last night. And then there's apparently kind of a staircase that goes, it's not really a staircase, but kind of some logs that show that there might have been a way to go down into the canyon. Um, but then you'd have to actually zigzag about six miles up that canyon over to the west to get to Aztec. So did they do that? Maybe. But was that about being due north? Probably not, because it's not actually due north, right? <laughs> So, so I agree with Steve that it was likely a successor, and I think he's the first one that had that idea, so I should you know, give him credit for that. But as far as exactly how it happened, I think we disagree on, on the details there. And I could go on, but that's probably enough about Aztec, so I hope I satisfied you. Well, maybe in relation to that, how does Salmon really fit into this picture that you're describing right now? Okay, great question. Salmon is up there next to Aztec, not far away in Bloomfield. How many have been to Salmon? Great, yeah, everybody, I love this crowd. So, uh, and it's founded around the same time, maybe a little earlier. You know, it, it looks a lot like, I think it's Hungo Pavi. It has a footprint that looks really similar to some of the great houses in Chaco, or one of the great houses in Chaco Canyon. And I think if my memory's right, it's Hungo Pavi. And it seems like it was thrown up in, I think it's three big stages. Um, there was an excavation there, as you probably know, Cynthia Earl Williams got a tremendous amount of material, and then, the report was never finished for a variety of reasons, and then Paul Reed and Archaeology Southwest kind of took that over, and since then have analyzed and published a lot of, on a lot of the materials that she excavated. So we know a lot about it in terms of how it was constructed and when it was constructed. Um, so late 1000s and then into the 1100s, again, on the banks of the, um, the San Juan, or not the San Juan. Yeah, they, no, not the Animus. No, it is the San Juan. Thank you, yeah. Anyway, it floods is the point. So the flood has come up and actually wiped out a big chunk of the plaza and taken out part of the Great Kiva. And that might have been part of the reason why it didn't stick and become an Aztec because it turned out to be not a great place in the end. But people were living in that great house. That was determined by the excavation, certainly. And there's also, I believe, the tree ring dates from the excavation suggest that the construction might have happened in connection with lunar standstills which is pretty neat. If you think about lunar standstills as a way to gather people together for the labor. So um, hopefully that, does that address your question? Chimney Rock works that way too. Chimney Rock works that way, yeah. Chimney Rock definitely works. I mean, if, if I was, I'll tell you the truth, I was always convinced by the solstice evidence because of the sun dagger, but the lunar standstill business, I was always a little bit, you know, I thought, well, maybe, maybe, Anna, but what if you stood over here? You know, would you really see alignment? And then about, when was it, 2006? There was the, the lunar standstill year at Chimney Rock, and it actually happens for about three years in a row. Maybe some of you had the opportunity to see it. Um, I was teaching at Colorado College at that time, and I was determined we were gonna go. So I took a van load of students over from Colorado College on the solstice, and we went up and, um, and watched the, it was the full moon closest to the solstice, actually, it wasn't on the solstice, but it was the full moon closest to the solstice. And when I saw that full moon rise between those two pillars, I was converted. I was a believer. Because you know what I was looking at? I felt, I mean, and this was just me, right? I didn't have any reason to, I didn't read this somewhere, but just looking at it, I felt like I'm, I'm looking at emergence. That's what this is. This is, the moon is, is, is 
like a baby coming through a birth canal or something. It's, it's rising between these two pillars, and uh, it's such a powerful thing. And so the fact that there's a great house right there on that spot, I mean, yeah, they, they knew about the standstill. And maybe it was that phenomenon that just happened kind of serendipitously at Chimney Rock because of the pillars and the situation at the Mesa that actually got Chacoans thinking about the moon and then incorporating the moon into their buildings, like Anna has argued, maybe. But I don't think you can dispute that this is a thing at Chimney Rock. And if you haven't seen it, it'll happen again in what, 18 and a half years after 2006. So what is that? Coming up, coming up pretty soon, right? <laughs> Time flies. <laughs> can you, 18 and a half years, I will, I'm hoping to be around then. Um, but, but can you explain what a lunar standstill is? Yeah, okay, so, so unless Anna's here. here. I don't think she's here. She'd do a better job. Okay, okay so, so you may or may not have realized that the moon doesn't rise in the same place every night, you know, I'm like, well, you know what the sun does, it kind of peregrinates further and further to the south, and then we get the winter solstice, and then it peregrinates further and further to the north. Um, but the, the moon does similar things, but it swings back and forth, where the full moon comes up, swings back and forth. And it takes 18 and a half years for it to come back to its northernmost or its southernmost um, point of rising on the horizon. So this is knowledge that you would have if you were paying attention, but you'd have to be in the same place for 18 and a half years, and you'd have to mark it for, for 18, you know, 19, 20 years, or actually, you'd probably have to mark it for like 36 years and make sure that it was a pattern that was really, yeah, people are nodding, good, yeah. You'd have to, you'd have to mark it. So, uh, so it's not the kind of knowledge that's so obvious for farmers to pay attention to, right? And I mean, Chacoans, they're farmers, they're of course paying close attention to what the sky is doing, what the seasons are doing. Rain is a really important thing. The position of the sun in the sky is really important um, in terms of planting and, and harvesting and all of that. But, um, but the moon, you know, maybe not so important. But there are ancient folks around the world who did pay attention to the moon. So why do you do that? I mean, part of it might have to do with exclusive access to important ritual knowledge. Because it's something that anyone could observe, but you'd have to really pay attention to, to get that knowledge. And it might be, and here I'm you know, imagining, that if folks at Chimney Rock had observed it, just because serendipitously they lived in a place where they had these amazing markers, then that might have been something pretty special that made them or made the leaders of their particular community um, powerful or special in some way. And that might be something that, that Chaco wanted or something that they brought to Chaco and said, hey, folks at Chaco, we'd like to participate in your gatherings here. Because Chimney Rock's actually pretty far away from Chaco. We'd like to participate in your gatherings here. We know about this really cool thing. And so maybe they brought Chacoans up, and the Chacoans saw it and went, yeah, and put a, put a great house there, and then kind of tried to, to, to rope it into the, the, the Chacoan domain of, of ritual knowledge. But it's a powerful thing, so thanks for asking about that. And, and the gentleman who's nodding, if you want to add anything here, because you may know more about this than I do. Well, to me, it's an example of how limited we are actually in thinking, oh, they're looking at this 36 and a half years, and then in, in 47 years, they got it. And then they built this thing, and then the moon comes up and down. That, that, I don't think that's how it happened. It, it's like they looked at this for thousands of years, and maybe they brought it where they ended up at a particular time. But they didn't build something because they looked at something for 36 and a half years, not knowing what it is. So we, that's like pinpointing at a certain historic time. But the degree of, of, of knowledge and interest has to be much broader in the past of theirs and their future. Sure. Yeah, yeah no, I don't, I don't disagree with that. And maybe I wasn't entirely clear. Um, if you were just living out on a flat, horizontal plane, you would need to be just watching the moon and marking it, right, to, to get this knowledge. But um, but people who lived actually further to the east, like the Mississippian civilization, they also were marking the moon. They were marking it with stakes in the ground. So they were, they were paying attention. People at Chimney Rock, uh, there is evidence for occupation there that goes back, well, at least to basket maker times. And so those folks are definitely seeing it. They're seeing it. And it might be thousands of years that they're observing it, or it certainly was hundreds of years that they're observing it. And, and they knew about it. They didn't need to um, go out on a horizontal plane and then plant a stick because they had the pillars to to market for them. 
Oh, wow, I don't even know where to go. I think the woman in front has, has had her hand up for a while, so. <laughs> Population density uh, well, in these areas over the 400 year period which it was changed, given that longevity was not great. Okay, yeah, yeah well, the $6 million perennial Chaco question how many people lived in Chaco? And, you know, I can't answer it. I can tell you a lot of things that are kind of a non answer um, because it kind of depends on, on what you count and when you count, right? So, um, certainly in the outlier communities, We've got maybe 20 to 40 habitations, and if we figure, like let's say 30 habitations, and maybe each one of those has maybe five to 10 people in it, so maybe we're talking about, you know, maybe we're talking about hundreds, but we're more likely talking about like maybe 100 people, 150 people, something like that in an outlier community. In Chaco Canyon itself, you know, as you said, it's, it kind of depends on when. So early on, I think Chaco was pretty clearly um, people that were farming and habitations. And so we could count maybe the early rooms in say Pueblo Benito and do the same kind of math and say, we've got hundreds of people here, okay? But uh, during Chaco's heyday, with all those big buildings, there's a tremendous amount of argument and disagreement, I think, among Chaco scholars as to whether we should count all those rooms as representing people or not, right? And we can go down that rabbit hole if you want to. But I think that most people would probably agree it looks like there were about maybe 2,500 people in Chaco max at its, at its heyday, but maybe that number was more when people came in for events, or maybe it was less, but I don't think it was actually a lot more on, a long, on, on the long term. Uh, okay, the gentleman. Thank you. I'm interested in Roads being used as trade routes, mercantile routes, going up as far as Mississippi and as far as South Saskatchewan. Is, is, is there evidence of the equivalent of caravanseries along those routes or oases where people would have, uh, have gathered and left things behind? I mean, the short answer is kind of no, but <laughs> but that's not really that's not really a good answer. So. I, the roads have always perplexed folks because they are these linear alignments and they do connect Chaco to, as I showed last night, certain places on the landscape. And they also do connect Chaco to some outliers that are along those routes, but not all. And there's also a lot of road segments that are just that, they're segments, they're floaters. They're maybe a couple of kilometers long and they point in different directions. So for example, um, I did a lot of work back in the Andrews, back in, in the day, the Andrews Chaco community, which is kind of southeast, about 80 miles or so from Chaco, or southwest rather. And there's a road segment there that's kind of floating, and as you come up to the Great House, you can see it, but beyond that, it's not clear what it's doing. Um, so, so it's not clear that the roads were really for transportation, right? And this is something that, now I've changed my thinking on it a little bit over the years, but I guess I kind of fudge it a little bit. I think that the roads, when they, when they come into places like Outliers or places like Chaco Canyon, they do seem like they would have been great procession routes. They would have been great kind of formal entrances. So it might have been that, yeah, you can get into Chaco Canyon just by going on a normal trail, but when you're going for like a high holy day or whatever, you're going for something important, it's important to maybe process on the road, or maybe only certain people are allowed to process on the road. But I think the primary importance of, of roads like the North Road or the South Road were actually, actually had to do with where they were pointing and how they were inscribing Chaco as the center. I don't think it was so much about facilitating travel. Um, and, and while of course there's trade and there's movement of goods around the, the Pueblo world and, and, and points south and, and north and east and west, the roads don't seem to be of critical importance to that. Now, okay, a little asterisk by everything I just said. We're also doing a tremendous amount now with LIDAR to document more road segments that we haven't found in the past. So that picture may change. I mean, it's already changing and people are finding more out there than we knew was there. Um, but as of my knowledge at this moment, I would say that it's kind of a, a not correct to assume that the roads are for trade. That, that's not their primary. Um, function. You asked about stopping places along the way. I mean, same thing. If you're going to process on the road, there are these outliers where you could potentially stop. And the Chaco project looked a lot at features along the roads to try to kind of argue pro or con that. And I mean, it's possible, but again, because most people probably weren't just traveling on the roads, that doesn't seem to be their, their primary 
use, if that makes sense. Yes? Um, I, this is not here, I've, I've read in several archaeological papers that when the residents left the Pueblo, they often covered up the well where they had underground water, and they, and they just covered up the well. And so I've often pondered where did they get the water from? You see, there are often a good amount of water for 20,000 people, let alone 250. Well, and that probably would have been a serious constraint. It's quite possible there, uh, there are, could be aquifers there that they were tapping. They know that they burned some of their buildings when they left. Did they also plug up some of the wells that they might have had? Okay, I, I know you asked me not to, Chip, but I have to call on you because you're Mr. Chaco Water right now, so you can answer that question better than I can. Um, could, you, could you say something about the water table at Chaco and the availability of water um, in your right. knowledge of it? <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, hi. Um, the, I know of no wells in Chaco Canyon. They're prehistoric. There are a bunch of historical ones. Um, including some around Palo Benito. There are, um, in the 10 hundreds, there were some diversion channels to direct water from off the, the mesa tops on in, into the areas around some of the buildings. Today, you go out there and there's a big arroyo that runs through the middle of the canyon. That wasn't there, um, except very, very briefly in the 10 hundreds. Uh, and the water table was uh, certainly higher. But what we see geologically is that the whole 10 hundreds period is one of extreme flooding in the canyon. Um, it's just a lot of water pouring in. Um, I think we have two meters of deposition within less than 100 years. And that, that's striking. Um, that's, there's a lot of surface water available. And there are springs that were certainly active at the time. But um, it's, not, it's not Aztec. There's no free flowing stream. Um, so. But I, I don't know of any wells. Well, the, the, um, Chip, thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but you know it's really important, I guess, to recognize always that there's so many pieces to Chaco and archaeology that it's hard for any of us to know a lot about all of them. And we do have experts in the room, so I, I really appreciate you sharing your, your expert knowledge about Chaco water. Thanks. I, I have a related question. So it's this sort of rule of thumb in evolutionary anthropology that to mobilize large labor force, you have to have significant surplus production, right? I mean, I think when I see the evidence on how many thousands of logs were hauled from the Chuscas to build, you know, these structures and to say nothing of the stonework and other things, I mean, what do we know about agriculture in, in Chaco in these periods? Is it, is it is, do we know anything at all? Patty, uh, Patty's <laughs> laughing because she knows that's another chip question. Because <laughs> he just wrote a really great article that actually addresses your question okay, exactly. Well, and I don't want to just paraphrase. I apologize for my ignorance. No, no, I don't want to just paraphrase his argument, though. I, I really like it. Um. Well, you can paraphrase it and attribute it to Dick Ford. <laughs> no. Maybe Dick Ford would like to. Is Dick Ford going to say something about No, Vern Scarborough here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a mystery, or at least something we need to look into. I'm do it. Because it's not my argument, I'm not going to do it. Um, I just had a question. Uh, you can refresh our memories or whatever. The correlation with the drought cycle that went through in that area, is there a correlation between the um, drought and a response to building great architecture in a religious sense to, to, to get attention to get more rain. And the reason I'm asking, uh, and it's a very blunt question, but I see that in the, in the rock art. I see this going along, going along, and then during the drought, there's a correlation with a fluorescence of depictions of clouds and sky deities and, and this big effort to get attention, to get the clouds, to bring the rain back um, as they're going through this terrible stress period. How, how are you dating the rock art? I'm curious. How are you dating the, oh, the rock art? We've done, I, I've done this for the last 30 years, just studying the stuff in the uh, northern 
uh, San Juan Basin and up okay. uh, and around the Rio Grande, I started here in Santa Fe. But um, we did a, a dating project in 2002 of the Barrier Canyon style paintings, but we also grabbed some dates from some Pueblo Three sites, uh, Five Faces site, um, um, uh, Sun Youth site, I call it that. Anyway, um, and so it shows this uh, resurgence uh, or a return back into this homeland in the north mm -hmm. of, um, in canyon lands and in Cedar Mesa and stuff where they've gone back and really painted elaborate paintings of, of this rain and lightning and, and all of that stuff. And it's superimposed over the older stuff. The basket maker stuff is then superimposed by Pueblo II and then Pueblo III. Um, so it just gets bigger, like you're seeing here with the great architecture, it gets bigger and bigger. And does that correlate to the drought cycle? That's my question. So, yeah, I mean, I guess I sort of see several questions there, and one is about the rock art correlating to the drought, right? Um, or or to, to, yeah, and, and there's a lot of uh, research that's actually gone on in Chaco Canyon documenting the rock art. Um, I have some wonderful colleagues, Jane Colber and Kelly Hayes Gilpin and Donnie Yoder, who have uh, amassed a tremendous amount of knowledge about Chaco rock art, of which there is apparently quite a bit. It's like, you know, you see some of it when you're a tourist in the canyon, but a lot of it's off in the side canyons and what have you. And they're writing a book, and that book is eventually going to be published, and then we'll all, we'll all know <laughs> the answer to that. Um, but rock art, I think, is, it's, you know, it's hard, it would be hard to correlate it within a span of 300 years in, in Chaco Canyon to know if that had anything to do with with fluctuations in rainfall. Now, the argument about whether great houses are built in response to um, dry times or, or as a result of really wet times, Lynn Sebastian wrote a book about that in the early 80s in which she tried to um, test that, that idea because we have, of course, excellent information about um, wetness and, and rainfall and climate in Chaco. And as I recall, it didn't exactly work very well. And so she tried to kind of bend the model to, to explain the patterns. And it seems like, yeah, during high Chaco, yeah, there was a fair amount of water, as you were just hearing. So it seems likely that, um, that, that great houses get built in part because it's a time when people can be in Chaco. You know, they can, they can grow corn, and there, there is enough water to gather a lot of people together. Uh, and the, the late Benito phase, as I understand, um, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, someone was actually a really wet time. It was like a really big resurgence of, of um, really good rainfall after a brief period when it wasn't so good. And, but then things really kind of taper off and then you see people moving to the north. So there's a relationship there, but I don't know that it's as simple as saying, well, it's raining a lot, so let's build a great house, or it's not building, so let's build a great house. I don't know that that, that actually works very well. Yes, and then, I think, I think, I, I don't know. <laughs> Who should we call it? How about the, the lady in the front here? Or you already have one, right? Okay, all right, whoever has a microphone, yeah. Okay, um, this is about rock art. And okay. Maybe back to astronomical observations. Can okay. you speak to the supernova depiction, I think? Uh-huh. Um, I took a trek there once, and yeah. it was around 1066, I think. Well, I think this, the problem, well, I think if I'm not mistaken, this, the actual explosion of the supernova has recently been redated, hasn't it? So I'm not sure that that works as well anymore than we thought it did for a while. But you guys all know this, right? There's this kind of star and moon um, pictograph near the Great House of Pinasco Blanco. And so folks have said, well, maybe that had something to do with depicting the supernova. I mean, it's possible. It's possible, right? And certainly if Chacoans were were looking at the sky as much as I think they certainly were, something like a really bright flare in the night sky would have been something they would have noticed. So it's possible. That's about all I can say. Yeah. Yes, in the front? Oh, sorry. Okay. I'd like to, to uh, comment or, or to have you comment on a portion of your talk yesterday of contemporary recent visits of delegations from Zuni and, and uh, Diné people. I'm particularly interested in what the, the, the fascination might be for the Navajo in the Chaco culture uh, uh, 
in that we have been taught over the years that the Navajo are very aversive and phobic of ruins and uh, of the ghosts that live in the ruins. And this, this seemed to be a very, uh, a very, a group quite congenial to the, to the uh, anthropology of, of Chaco. Curious about their, their interests and motivation. Okay, thank you for that question. First, I'm just gonna say, if anyone in the room would like to speak to that, I would be happy to Okay, she's shaking her head, so <laughs> I'll attempt to address that. Um, so the, the issue of, of Diné involvement in, in Chaco Canyon is, is, a, is a controversial one and a thorny one, for sure. Um, but look at the Navajo territory today, look at the reservation today, and see how Chaco Canyon actually is right in the middle, and see how so many of the outliers are actually on Navajo Nation land. So first of all, one could certainly never dispute that, that Diné people today have a claim to the archeology span that's, that's in their backyard or that's, that's around where they live in the sense that you know, these are places that they know ancient folks lived and they feel some, some sense of, of relationship to that and whether that's about avoiding it as I have heard some of my Navajo friends talk about or whether it's a matter of simply respecting it um, I did have a, a Navajo friend recently tell me that the whole we have to avoid the ruins thing was their grandmother saying, um, don't, don't disrespect it. You know, so little kids, you can't really trust them to visit a site with respect, so just don't, don't go there, avoid it, right? And that's certainly kind of a trope that's, that's out there. But um, over the years, as I've talked to my Diné friends, they've shared with me Diné oral traditions that do tie them to Chaco Canyon, do tie particular clan histories to Chaco Canyon. There are several clans that talk about being uh, descended from places like Kenya'a um, or, or other, um, I'm forgetting the name of the other great house now, and nobody's gonna help me out, I'm guessing. But there are clan histories that, that, that do talk about Chaco being in their past. And then of course the Navajo have the story of the great gambler and a very powerful story about how in the past there was an individual living at Chaco who gradually gathered a lot of people together, but he tricked them and he enslaved them all. And then finally he in turn was tricked and the people were freed. And um, the, the sense is that the gambler was somebody that was in, enslaving Navajo people. And I've had Navajo folks tell me this, that these were our ancestors who were actually building Chaco. So there's kind of a received story in archeology, span and I'm not sure exactly when it got started, but that Navajo come in much later, Athabascans come in much later, and they have nothing to do with the Pueblo past. And I think that's a real problem for several reasons. First of all, that's not what the Diné themselves are telling us, and we need to listen to and respect what, what Native people in the present are telling us about their own past. And secondly, the archaeology more and more keeps pushing dates back in the gubernador, you know, got very early examples of Fort Stick Hogans and what have you going back into the 1300s, 1200s. And thirdly, the Diné themselves tell a story about how Navajo came to be, how Diné people came to be that involves a gathering of the clans. And so they're not Diné before people come together on the banks of a river, probably the San Juan River, and they all share the different kinds of um, skills that they have. Um, some bring farming, some bring pottery, some bring hunting, et cetera, et cetera. And as a result of this experience, they become Diné. So you could say that Navajo or Diné didn't exist before the gathering, but that doesn't mean that the ancestors of the people at the gathering were not at Chaco. Does that make sense? And if you think about Chaco as a place um, ceasing to become a center in the 1100s, 1200s. And if you think of everything that happened after the 1200s into the 1300s as a time when a lot of people are moving around, it's very easy to think about clans or groups that were involved in Chaco, but then maybe don't farm. Maybe they go back to hunting and gathering, or maybe they're living in really kind of remote areas, and they're not kind of the core people. They're not the elites with the knowledge. And the Athabascans arrive at some point and they get together and they come, become Diné. I mean, that's a possibility. Um, I think this whole kind of discussion here is really a research issue that archeologists have failed to adequately explore. So let's not 
stand on some kind of historical precedent and just say Navajo people don't have anything to do with Chaco. I think it's really clear that they have plenty to do on all the levels that I just talked about. And let's try to figure out, you know, as archaeologists, so what might that have looked like? And here I just spun you one story, but it, may, it might be wrong. But let's try to let's try to actually make this a research question rather than just you know categorically thinking we know the answer. So I hope I did some justice to <laughs> good. I'm being nodded at. <laughs> Thank you. In relation to this, it seems to me we also need to talk about the Hopi, the Akama, the other groups that that clearly also. Uh, claim their relationship directly to Chaco and still go back and forth and are also in, occupying that same space. So can you bring those into the answer you just gave us? Absolutely, yes. And you know, I, I'm kind of defending the Diné position here in part because theirs have been the voices that have been marginalized, but certainly nobody disputes that Pueblo people have a very strong claim to Chaco. Um, it was an ancient Pueblo, right? And so in thinking about which Pueblos or et cetera. Chaco was a place, my, my, my Pueblo colleagues, like for example, my Zuni colleagues that I was just um, in Chaco with a few months ago, they were telling me about how in their oral histories, Chaco was a place that gathered. Chaco was a place that drew a lot of different groups together. And then when Chaco was over, those groups went their separate ways. So there's nothing um, that contradicts oral tradition or that really contradicts the archaeology if we think about perhaps ancestors of all of contemporary Pueblos in some form or another being at Chaco. Um, where it gets kind of thorny is um, Pueblo people themselves have their own origin stories and they talk about how they came to be. And like, for example, Hopi, a lot of you probably know, um, have clan histories that talk about how different clans end up at the Hopi mesas. And so to say that Hopi people were at Chaco doesn't mean like the entire tribe of Hopi was camped out at Chaco and they were Chetro Kettle or something like that. But what it means is that ancestors of some of those clans that ended up at Hopi were also people that were at Chaco, okay? And I think you could make that argument for all of the Pueblos, certainly. And some of the Pueblos feel this very, very strongly. The Akama feel it very strongly. The Hopi feel it very strongly. The Zuni feel it very strongly. My Zuni friends also made great pains to emphasize to me that if any Pueblo says that we are the descendants of Chaco and not you, that's, that's wrong, right? Because Chaco is for all of us. They feel really strongly about that. Um, Eastern Pueblos, I think you can make claims there as well. And I certainly have had conversations with Eastern Pueblo folks about that. And that's the piece that's kind of missing in our, in our project right now, our online um, video vignettes. And so that's a piece that we'd like to move to next and invite representatives from Eastern Pueblos if they'd like to come and, and talk about Chaco with us. But I really feel that it's, it's inappropriate for me as you know, a white woman to basically tell any indigenous person, you have more or less claim. You know, it's for them to say and it's for me to listen. What evidence has been uncovered for sharing water among the out outliers with the uh, main focus. Of okay, the uh, water at the outliers. So it'd be kind of impractical to actually move water from the outliers into Chaco because you're usually talking about at least five or maybe sometimes 15 kilometers between outliers. So that'd be, as I know from having walked across long distances carrying water, I mean, any of you, <laughs> yeah, it gets real heavy real fast. So I don't know that that would be terribly practical to do. Outliers, just like Chaco Canyon itself, would have had to have been founded in places where they had adequate water and where they had adequate water to farm. So they would have been in places where you could maybe have a confluence with the Chaco Wash or maybe you had a spring. So water was, would have been an important resource for people at the outliers. But as far as moving water around, I think that, that wouldn't have really been practical in Chaco in times. OK, let's see. Somebody who hasn't had a turn, maybe. So yeah, the young lady there. I understand the five and 15 kilometers. I know what they are. However, it's funny that exactly at this very present time, young girls in Rwanda or in Ghana have to do this exactly every morning, okay? So what we're doing here is we're negating, not in a, in a negative sense, but we're negating 
a whole tribe to do exactly that, what is practically being done on the African continent out in the bush every day today. Well, that, that, and I, that, that I may just, well be. I, but I mean, there's young girls traveling 10 kilometers every morning and 10 kilometers back to get water to a particular point between A and B. That, so that may well be. But um, I don't know what the climate is like in Rwanda, but I do know that if you're out in the San Juan Basin, you need to drink you know, a couple of gallons a day. And I think that, especially in the summer, it would be pretty impractical because you would drink all of the water that you were carrying before you got to the place where you were going. So, um, so I don't know, I mean, I, that may well be happening in Rwanda. I just think it might, it would be pretty impractical for that to have happened on any kind of meaningful scale in the Chaco world. Yes. The, the young lady with the glasses who's been trying. <laughs> Basket maker site, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if you have a sense of uh, any waves of territorialization, territorializing waves that may have occurred during the occupation of the canyon. Okay, um, she's asking about the territorialization, which was part of the theoretical framework that I was using in the article that I sent around, and I don't know if everybody had an opportunity to read that, so I don't know if I should, should I talk about territorializing a little bit, so you guys know, yeah. So there's a there's a, a body of theory right now in archaeology that some of us are kind of interested in, and one of these constructs is something called assemblage theory, and the idea is that um, it's a good way to think about the relationship between people and places and animals and plants and materials and buildings without kind of categorically subdividing all of those elements and it's a really flexible kind of way to relate things that belong together. And this may all sound kind of nebulous, but it's meant to be. So um, territorializing is when all the elements get drawn together, and deterritorializing is when they get split apart. And in the article that I sent around, I talked about ways in which Chaco gathered people and resources and buildings and animals, et cetera, together. Um, but then, of course, there's often forces that are are pulling those elements apart as well. And um, so the question about the J-shaped shrines, I think, is part of, and, and you know, I'm using this framework not as kind of a, a, a hard and fast, this is the only way to think about chocolate, but just kind of a tool to allow me to think about the relationships uh, across space uh, that, that Chacoans and that their world were part of. And so the, the J-shaped shrine is up on a high place, like many other features like this up on a high place. And I think that it probably served a lot of different or, or several different different functions or had, had a number of different meanings. On the one hand, it's up there on top of an ancient basket maker site. So it seems to be kind of marking where ancestors were. But it's also a high place that is then interconnected in terms of intervisibility to a lot of other of these similar markers in and around the canyon. So when we did the the view net study, we were looking at the intervisibility of these features. So if these features are about communicating or intervisibility kind of pulling people together, then that's very much a territorializing sort of action, right? Does this make sense? So everybody who can see each other in the Chaplin world, being able to see each other is one way that the Chaplin world is drawn together. And marking where the ancestors lived is another kind of territorializing through time. You're saying this is where the ancestors were, and I'm here today, and through time we're drawn together. So it's, it's a symbolic thing, basically, but uh, but it's uh, it, it it could be construed as part of that that deterritorializing gathering. So I hope that all made sense. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Louise. Yeah. yeah. Um, no. Can you, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, so as an old world archaeologist, uh, new to all things Chacoan, um, uh, and, and the, in the old world we have constant overwrought discussions of the identification of elites and, and or even priests. So I'm kind of interested in how in the Chacoan context uh, I hear con constant reference to uh, elites and or priests, how, how generally speaking this identification has has arisen, what's the evidence for their presence? Ah, another perennial question. So, okay. 
Chaco has been in the crosshairs of a lot of argument about sociopolitical hierarchy for a long time, um, partly because there's clearly some big stuff going on there. We have all these big buildings, but we have people who are, are essentially farmers and they're living in kind of farming towns and the population wasn't that great. So throughout the 70s, 80s, there was a lot of back and forth about, you know, was Chaco a state or what level should we pigeonhole Chaco into? I think Steve Letson actually did his dissertation on that. So, uh, so there, there's been a lot of kind of focus on what level, you know, what, what's, the, what's the sociopolitical organization like in Chaco? And I think at this point in time, we've all kind of come to the realization that those kinds of arguments aren't that productive and that there pretty clearly was a lot of power at Chaco. There was a lot of authority at Chaco, particularly during its heyday, to get those big planned buildings erected, right? Um, and to get those roads built. So there's no question that somebody's directing some other people to do some stuff. And there's no question that you have a lot of people there. And if we look at all of the ethnography from the descendant communities, and if we look at the evidence in Chaco, we can see that, that ritual practices were clearly a big part of things that were going on in Chaco. And it makes sense that in uh, contemporary indigenous life, religious knowledge is something that is um, often linked closely to having social power or political power. You don't really separate those things. If you have a lot of religious knowledge, you are an important person in a group, and that may or may not translate directly into control over resources, but it almost certainly translates into you having social status of some kind or another and the ability to you know, kind of oh, have your, or, or, or have some authority. So I think in that way, certainly there was, there was power being exerted at Chaco, and this may have been in the form of like elite if I want to say, use the word elite, but, um, but clans or, or sodalities or groups that had more of that than others, because somebody had some, right? So it's pretty clear that that was going on. But once we start down the kind of Lexan road and we start talking about Chaco as a state, um, that's where I get off the train because we don't have a lot of the accoutrements that we would need to say people at Chaco had some kind of absolute control over people at the outliers. You know, there was no standing army. There was no kind of evidence of some really drastic differentiation between a very small group of people and everybody else. So that's a very muddy answer, but I think that's kind of where we are. I think we, we need to not try to pigeonhole Chaco according to these um, notions that we developed it through new evolutionism across the, the 20th century and instead ask exactly what kinds of power can we see happening with the archaeological evidence at Chaco and then what might that have looked like and, and try to describe it more than label it. I want to sort of follow up on this whole business about assemblies and this other way of thinking. You, I mean, clearly one of the things you're trying to do in your work is get away from our Western categories like the state or hierarchies and try another way that is derived again from Western thought but doesn't exactly, uh, you know, could, could be a little more flexible. Uh, on the other hand, I, f I see a lot of romanticism in what you're doing, partly because you're trying to like get the kind of feeling of or, or, or how, what people's emotions and feelings and uh, thoughts are, you know, in, in a period you can't really get to otherwise. Uh, so I'm, wo I'm wondering how you try to balance those things in addition to the other thing I see in your work, which is really important, is the use of indigenous people to kind of tell you what they think of the place and how they conceptualize it, because that is one way to get to sort of a non-Western view of what it was. So I, can you talk a little bit more about how you try to balance those things or whether you think you're being overta overtaken by one or the other or what? Thank you. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And yeah, I, 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 you know, my critics out there always say, well, this is a very romanticized view of chocolate. And you know what, they're, they're right and no, and, and this is definitely, something that I struggle with, right? Because um, I'm trapped in my own body and my own sensibility as a white Western woman. You know, I can't know what it is to be indigenous, I can't know what it was to be Chaco, and, and yet I've always felt very strongly that sense of place is, is critical. In, in, for indigenous people, it's critical. For all of us, it really is. But, you know, you've probably all read, I hope you've read Keith Basso's Wisdom Sits in Places. I mean, what it's like to be in a place and to tell stories about the landforms that you see and to, to, to feel intimately connected to landscape, that's part of, I think, of an indigenous way of being. So how do I try to understand that? I mean, first of all, 
I don't think you can understand a place like Chaco without addressing that. And to, to talk about Chaco without addressing that, we're missing like a big piece of what's important at Chaco. But then how do you do that if you're you know, a white woman? Well, you can talk to descendant communities and listen to what they have to say. Um, but then I've also, and I've done that, and I continue to do that humbly, I hope, respectfully, but I also have done a lot of reading in Western philosophy and because that's you know, where I'm trained. And so I do, I think, kind of try to, I don't know, meld the two, or I try to use concepts that I find useful. So this assemblage concept I find useful, and it, it bears a relationship to the things that Seb Fowles was talking about in his Archaeology of Doings book, another great um, essay or press book that you should all read, um, in which he again says, you know, let's not try to separate out here's the religious, here's the economic, et cetera. Let's think about how for a Pueblo person all of these elements work together and how everything you do from the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to sleep at night it is a form of ritual or it is religious. You know, you're saying prayers, you're doing things to keep the world in balance as you go about your business. So that's not that dissimilar from using a concept like assemblage. So one could say, one could launch the argument then why use the assemblage business at all? You know, why not just, just use native, native categories? And that would be, I think, a fair critique to make. And I guess my defense would be because I'm not a native person and so I'm just trying to find other tools that also fit with that. Does that answer? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I was told many years ago when I first started going to Chaco that they found, they being people like you, six I think it was, and they called them Mexicans, r very ritually dressed people um, who were in, in, in the houses, and they had teeth, they had been ground down to points. Okay, I, okay. I, I is think... That, is that true? Or um, <laughs> I think you're, I think, uh, I think you're conflating uh, several different things, actually, that are happening, or that we have evidence for in Pueblo Benito. And so, yeah, there is, there are a couple of areas inside of Pueblo Benito where there's burials, uh, human, you know, people were interred, and they have a lot of lavish goods interred with them, okay? So that, that, that has happened, and it's more, than, it's more than six. There's two individuals who are under a plank floor in one particular part of Pueblo Benito, and then there's a lot of other um, people in there as well. But um, as far as the, the filed teeth and the other part of your question, Christy Turner wrote an unfortunate book <laughs> um, that was published, I think, about 20 years ago now arguing that people from, Toltec people came up from Mesoamerica and found in Chaco. And the filed teeth were part of that discussion. And I, I think there is a tooth that one could potentially argue, but I'm not actually a, a specialist in that, and it's one tooth. So I think most of us think, let's just move on from that, that conversation. <laughs> As a follow-up to the comments about elitism and power, what's the role of conflict within these communities? Uh -huh, I guess following from the other question. <laughs> so there's, I mean, ancient Chagoans were just like all of us. There certainly was conflict, right? Um, some of us see the time of Chaco as a time when there might have been less than before or after. We certainly have evidence for some pretty horrific conflict that happened around 800 north of Chaco Canyon, uh, up in southern Colorado. There's a site where a lot of people were massacred and some, some bad things went down. And then after Chaco was over, in the 1100s, up in the Four Corners, there are a number of sites where, again, some very bad things went down and a lot of people died. So we know that conflict happened, but we don't see so much of that in Chaco Canyon, and we don't see so much of that during the Chaco era. So whatever Chaco was, it seems to have been a time, I think, when people were coming together and cooperating and, and um, kind of pulling in the same direction, but it didn't last. But it did seem to last about 300 years, so you know, it's not bad, right? Uh, hi. Um, I wanted to ask a question more on the architectural side of things. Okay. Um, 
I've always been intrigued at Pueblo Bonito by the early initial curves in, in the shape and the final actually beautiful D shape and, and the majesty of it when it would be completed. And I know that people say that um, the influences, which is my question, certainly come from McPhee early on. And I'm, I'm just very interested in, in what influences before McPhee mm -hmm. potentially and, and then during the uh, final construction of the, of the D shape. Oh, thanks. I'd love to talk about that architecture. So yeah, um, when you look at the, the earliest aggregated pueblos, you know, they're not in Chaco Canyon, they're, they're to the north. They're up in like southeast Utah, southwest Colorado. And you get some pretty big villages like McPhee that you mentioned and some of the other places that were excavated by the Dolores Project. Or you get places like Alkali Ridge um, in southeast Utah. And it's the first time really that you had hundreds of people living together in the same place. And they're building these above ground rooms and they're attaching them one to the other. And there seems to be kind of two shapes and one shape is just a whole bunch of long lines and then the other shape is more curved and involves something that's more kind of enclosing. And so there have been some interesting uh, discussions by some of my colleagues who work up in that time period about possible differences in um, even ethnicity or, or, um, or social organization that might relate to those different shapes. Um, the, the curved business, you could think about how, um, well, I, don't, I, don't, I won't go there. Um, I was gonna say something about how or even earlier in, in basket maker times when people were building inside of, of overhangs, that, that would have been curved, but I don't know that that really works that well in, in all situations. But the, the curved shape of something like McPhee, as you pointed out, seems to be something that ends up getting, getting replicated in Pueblo Benito. And so I think it's just, it's just a very long-standing kind of notion of we've got a lot of people, we're gonna add on some more rooms and we're gonna just kind of enclose. So the idea of enclosure, I think, is really important. And that obviously carried through over time as people continue to make Pueblo Benito bigger and bigger I mean, big chunks at a time until they had an enclosed plaza. So I'm trying to ramble a bit, I'm sorry. I'm wondering if there's gonna be a bathroom break soon. <laughs> How are we doing, Michael? Uh, well, why don't we go another five minutes or so? Okay, great. I, can I follow up with a quick engineering question? So okay. the, the Chaco construction is dry laid stone, is that correct, or mm -hmm. is there mortar? A dry laid. So to, to, do, um, to do that kind of work at that scale, especially the height, I mean, there's some serious engineering that yeah. goes into it. So what, what do we know about that? Were there, uh, you know, it's not enough to think that there was specialization, but it's so different in scale from other periods, right? Yeah, uh, um, I think if you want to know how that the, the walls are laid, talk to the Navajo stabilization crew because <laughs> they okay. can tell you all about it. But, and and uh, there have been experiments and things that have been done too to try to kind of replicate and learn more about it. But yeah, I mean, it, it it's really interesting to see the the start of these full standing masonry walls because before then in the Pueblo One period you have usually it's hakal walls and you have just slabs instead of slab footers and so those footers are kind of propping up um, posts and then they're maybe weaving in some some branches or something and then they're kind of mudding over that and so why do they start to transition to to full standing masonry. Well, they don't do it all at once. And in fact, the earliest rooms in Pueblo Vida do have a lot of mortar. It's mostly like there's a lot of rocks just set in a lot of, a lot of mud. But eventually, when they start to do the things that we think of as classic Benito phase architecture, and it is dry laid, I mean, part of it, you've got the canyon walls right there. And so you've got this amazing resource right there that you can use. But part of it seems to be that at some point there's a recognition that if we lie these stones flat instead of sticking them like this or sticking them in mortar, that they're gonna last longer and we can go higher. And so it might partly have to do with trying to build buildings that, that go higher. And then you get the invention of corn veneer, and then yes, you can support something that's a couple of stories high, three stories high. Um, but it would have taken a tremendous amount of labor, and I don't have the figures in my head, but if you wanna know, I can tell you where you can go. Go to Steve Lexon's Great Pueblo Architecture book, published in 1984, and he's got labor estimates for all of the great houses in downtown Chaco in, the, in, that, um, in that book. So you can read about it there and get the exact numbers. But of course it gets tricky when you start talking labor because 
how long did it take, uh, take to build this wing of the Great House? Well, was it 20 people working for two months, or was it 200 people working for two days? You know, you get into those kind of, kind of questions. But structurally, you'd have to have a much stronger ba or bigger base yeah. to support the higher uh, right. you know, multiple and, story. And we have foundations. We have foundations extending out from Pueblo Benito that for a built part of Pueblo Benito that was apparently never built. And when we did our excavation at Aztec North, actually, that was one of the ways in which we knew Chacos had been involved. We had questions, one of our research questions was, you know, did Chacos actually build this Aztec North Great House, or was this local people maybe trying to attract some Chacoans? Because, you know, what is this Adobe stuff? You know, this is not, this is not pretty. Why did they do it this way? And so we were excavating down, and we got down to a room floor in the Great House, and then we went subfloor, and boom, there was this huge trench that was filled with these huge cobbles, and the trench was far bigger as a foundation trench than anything one would need to support some crappy you know, adobe wall. So it's pretty clear that, yeah, Chocolans were there laying it out, saying, put in the trenches, this is how you do it. They have the same kind of trenches down below at Aztec West, by the way, and that's why we're saying, yeah, Chocolans were here. Um, this is how you do it, let's lay it out. And then maybe the Chocolans left, and the locals said, all right, now we gotta finish this thing, so you know, what are we gonna do? We don't have the labor. That's another possible scenario. But yeah, so foundations were also important. Well, let's take two more questions and then wrap, our, unless there aren't any questions. So in terms of architecture, I'm thinking, okay, why do I need a house? I need a house to have shelter, but I also have a, need a house to have shelter, not only from the rain and the wind and whatever. I also need it from anybody from far away that can now see that I have a house. So basically what the whole thing means is that protection automatically comes with it. So if I back up to a cliff face and I build something round as opposed to strings on a pearl where I have one house, the next house, and the next house, which can much easier taken over by somebody that desires my house, so to speak, then if you're already putting in this incredible foundation, it is my thought that they must have thought about protecting themselves from the outside and from other tribes or interested parties from the very beginning on. So again, we don't have a lot of evidence for conflict during this time. I mean, I do have some colleagues that disagree, but I, I would say that this doesn't look like a particularly um, bad time in terms of being worried about people coming to attack you or something like that. And of course, again, remember that the earliest rooms in Pueblo Benito, it's, it's basically just a house for probably some families. It's later on when you get the classic Benito phase and you get these folks who are in charge of large quantities of labor that they want to build something massive that you start getting these foundations that I'm talking about. So why do you do that? I mean, I think part of it is about building something that is perhaps a, a, a stage for your ceremonies or something to signal to people coming into the canyon that this is a really powerful and important place and or maybe it's a house for the ancestors. So it's gotta be big and it's gotta take a lot of people to build, um, but it's not just about building a house to shelter you as like a family at that point in time. So it changes. And I don't think that, I mean, I wouldn't characterize you know, classic Benito phase, Pueblo Benito as a fort by any means, but it's a big monumental structure. But I think it's, it's about signaling these other kinds of ideas that are more important. One last question? No? We questioned out? Mm -hmm. With, uh, yeah. Davina. Davina. <laughs> um, aside from the work that you're doing with um, tribes and their interpretations of Chaco, are there other collaborative projects that you have that might be in the works with uh, tribal groups? Oh, that's a wonderful question coming from Davina. Uh, Davina and I once were trying to set up such a, such a collaborative project. And uh, something that you know, I've long wanted to do is involve tribal youth actually in, in archeology span if they're interested because it's a great way to um, you know, with tribal support, if, if they're interested in this, get them close to the archaeology and, and get them to kind of, you know, learn um, what archaeology might might do for them, uh, in a sense. And so, um, something that I'd like to do actually in the future is involve tribal youth in uh, in work at outlier communities, in particular. Um, one thing that we had talked about in the past actually was working with Diné archaeologists and potentially tribal youth on the very research questions that we were mentioning earlier, thinking about well, what is actually 
archaeological present, archaeologically present that might support some of the oral traditions that they may have about connections to Chaco. So I don't have anything planned for the, the you know, next summer, but that is something that's still very much on my mind, and I hope that I'm going to get the opportunity to follow up on some of that um, still in my career, which isn't quite over yet. So thanks, Davina. Well, please join me in thanking Dr. Van Dyke for a memorable discussion. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for all your great questions. <laughs>